Art of Fire Library Art Blast Blowing Studio in Northern Montgomery County in Maryland in the Mid Atlantic, and where we are awaiting our snowstorm, which will shut everything down on Sunday, and decided to do this on Saturday just for you. We're going to be making some glass this afternoon. Todd Hansen, who you will see making the piece of glass, is going to be making a piece that is called a Murini piece. What? Make what? Okay. Murini. I'll be doing the camera work and narration for you. We'd like to thank Brian Ritter for having recommended that we get involved in this. I understand that the majority of you are wood turners. There are some other crafters in here. We'll give you a little explanation of the glass blowing process. What Todd is doing right now is heating up a plate of what are called murini, or small squares of glass. And I'll hold one in front of the camera here and try to hold it very still and get it in front. So we have several of these around. So. We'll take another quick view of it here. The murini are pieces of glass that have been cut into small squares. They're very similar. This is cane here. And the cane had a white core and surrounded with gold glass and then pulled out to a thin diameter. We can also do the thing, same thing by twisting the canes. They're using their full length, longitudinally, but what we can also do is cut these into small pieces and look at them edge on. And that's what you're seeing with this green and orange one right here. That was a long piece of cane just like that, but then chopped up into very small squares. So that's the basis of what we're doing. Now, Todd has a ceramic plate over here with the Murini pieces on it. We'll get a little closer look. There you go, right there. The pieces of glass were preheated to approximately 900 degrees in an oven that we call an annealer. And they had to be preheated like that so that they, when they went into this reheating oven, which is running at about 2,300 degrees, they didn't experience a thermal shock and shatter. That's why Todd's heating them up for a short duration, bringing them back and heating with them. A very loud torch! Okay, and the reason he's using that torch right in the center of it is the outer edges of the Murini construction get hotter than the center portion, and we want them all to be in even heat. All of them were about the same size as the piece I showed you on the metal table a few moments ago. We're fusing them together. They have to be fused completely together so that they'll be rolled up in a sheet. Todd is now grabbing from our pipe warmer over there another pipe, and on that he has a collar. And he'll use that collar to roll across the sheet of Murinis and pick them up. They will roll up as a sheet when the hot pipe meets the hot Murini. We also have a really cool tool over here. I'm gonna turn around and show you real quickly we call it a pie divider. When we set the calipers to the exact dimensions of the sheet, the far end of it, because of the way it's curved, comes out to the exact 3.14 we need. Todd has his collar all done. Josh Reese here is going to make sure that it's loose and help Todd with the roll up by contacting the edge of the sheet and rocking back and forth. The Murini sheet comes around. It's not real flexible because of the extreme thickness of that. So when Todd gets that rolled around a bit, he'll start going into what we call the glory hole or the reheating of it. And he'll be over there 
for a few seconds and he'll get that fuse together. Now in a moment, he's going to take a small whisk brush and clean that off. When it lays on the ceramic plate, we have what's called kiln shelf, a uh, material that keeps the glass from sticking, but it will go onto the back of the piece a little bit and Todd is just brushing that free right now. In a moment, after he gets everything cleaned up and heated adequately, he'll begin to bring the two edges of that together to form a cylinder. So right now, it's still kind of in the sheet form, but in just a few moments, it's going to be a cylinder here. The unit that he's reheating in is called a glory hole. There is no glass in that. It's a ceramic tube that will withstand heat to about 2300 degrees. Now what we can see is Todd using his tweezers to bring the piece around and get it lined up. It's going to take a few shots at this because this stuff is not really gooey and flexible. It's still a little bit stiff and that's a good thing. So what he'll do is bring that around now I would like to mention while Todd's doing this reheating that every week on Tuesday mornings we go live with glass blowing demonstrations. At 10.30 Eastern Time in the U.S. we go on YouTube live and do about a half hour, oh call it an aperitif or advertisement. And we just do a little bit of something to get people's appetite whetted. Then at 11 a.m. Eastern Time we do a two-hour demonstration of various pieces. So this coming Tuesday, the 2nd, we'll be doing two hours worth of demonstrations on Facebook Live. At 10.30, we'll have a half hour of YouTube Live. Todd now is using a metal table, which we call a marver, and he's using that to shape the glass and bring the two edges around to seal. Once he gets this sealed and has his cylinder, then we'll be in business to begin the creation of the piece. It'll still be an open tube, but he'll begin to work on that. Now what would help us too on these broadcasts, if you could like or share, comment, uh, I see you all saying hello to each other. So if you've got any questions or any comments about the process, what's going on, what we're doing, I really can't explain why we do it, just because it's fun. But a lot of you are wood turners will eventually at a point in this process see a lot of similarity in that we're, uh, we're working on our piece horizontally Ours has to turn continuously or the gravity will make the glass sag toward the floor. But in many instances, we use tools for cutting and shaping that are slightly akin to what's done at the lathe. So if you'll share, like, and support us with your comments, we'd appreciate it. And check in with us next Tuesday if you get a chance. We've actually got folks from all over the place. Where are we located? Thank you, Michelle, for asking. We're located outside of Damascus, Maryland, in northern Montgomery County. We're uh, outside of Washington, D.C., north-northwest of there by about oh, 20 miles. We're also about 35 miles east of Baltimore as the crow flies. West, west. West of Baltimore, west, west of Baltimore, west of Baltimore, yeah. I'm trying to hold the camera and talk at the same time and reading the comments. We are west of Baltimore. We're, e we're east of the sun and west of the moon. There we go. Okay, all righty. So uh, that's where we're located. Uh, we have a chance, if there's a, a moment, we'll turn and show you the uh, gallery we have here. So a full service, glass blowing facility, one of the largest in the area. Ah, oh, Michelle's on Annapolis Road. Okay, come on over and check us out sometime. All right, so now you can see that Todd's got this sealed up. It's a tube. We'll look at the end of it. There we go. And all those little murini are now fused together. 
is going to continue to work this because every joint between two pieces of glass still has a little bit of a gap in it, okay? So he's going to smooth that out a lot. Uh, he'll probably be gathering over this, uh, and if he does with those gaps, it would trap air. So the next order of business is to get this construction really smooth, a nice smooth surface, and then he'll be able to take it from there. Well, somebody said, hey, Bruce, but I don't think that one was directed at me. That's probably two woodworkers. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, it's you. So you can see the color as Todd comes out of the glory hole. The heat of the glory hole raises the temperature of the glass, and it'll actually glow orange. That's because the metal oxides in it start to release the energy. And now he's getting this tube shaped up. Will you overlay or gather onto this? I believe he's going to gather. You're going to gather, Todd? Yeah, okay. So once he gets this uh, shaped into a cylinder and closes off the end of it, and then, uh, then he'll be able to gather over. It is possible to make the pieces without gathering over it. Uh, a lot of people will make you, on a smaller scale, want to use their Murini and just let it go at that. But uh, Todd's going to have a cylindrical vase for us today, and uh, it's going to be really nice. You're going to love this. Okay. When he comes out, you can see the orange glow in the glass. And just like you would turn over, she's got it horizontal. He has to center it up here. And he's making sure that it's a nice round shape. You can also see the moment for the momentary pauses he has in the turning, the piece sags toward the floor. So that's why we're constantly turning the glass. The longer he heats in the glory hole, the more the glass fuses together, the smoother the surface becomes, and off we go. Well, it's our pleasure to be part of the Virtual Craft Festival. We're glad to have been invited. Happy to be here and hope you enjoy the presentation. Now I did mention that Todd is reheating in a unit called a glory hole. I'll show you a little bit more about the studio without trying to take too much attention away from the glass blowing process. In fact, if you look beyond Todd, you can see out into our gallery. But uh, in a few moments, I'm going to show you our furnace. Right now you can see that bright orange glow from the great deal of heat that's in there. Some of you may wonder also about the, uh, the pipe. The pipe gets hot up for about the first 12 to 14 inches, so Todd is easily able to grip it further back and not get burned. In case you've just joined us recently, you're watching Todd Hansen at the Art of Fire Glass Blowing Studio outside of Damascus, Maryland. He's picked up a sheet of Murini, which are small squares of glass fused them together and formed them into a cylinder. So uh, we have a website, it's artoffire.com. We also have a presence on Facebook and we're on YouTube, obviously. Yes, we do offer glass, uh, we offer glass blowing classes. I'm assuming that's what Clinica means. However, they're temporarily suspended at this time because of the COVID issues and the comment just went away asking about uh so well somebody had a question we'll see if we get it back right now todd's layering a little bit of clear glass on the end of the tube so uh if the clinica is refer referring to classes we're not doing that right now we do a, we have done them for years we've been teaching here over 20 years so uh when things straighten out and get a little better, come on in and take a class. In the meantime, uh, we really do feel that our presentations on Tuesday mornings are quite educational, and we've even had some experienced glass blowers tell us that it's really worthwhile watching the work on Tuesday. Uh, how much time between reheats and shaping? Uh, well, 
I'm not going to set a stopwatch, but we can kind of check that out in a minute. I'd like to explain what Todd's doing right there. You saw him drape a small amount of clear glass on the end, then compress the cylinder, and he's now cutting it off. This helps him to avoid having to cut off a lot of the Murini. So this piece on the floor that he just cut off has a very small amount of Murini in it. And let's bring that on up, uh, turn it a little toward me, Josh. Yeah, and you can see how much Murini was in that disc. So very little waste. How long's Todd been glass blowing? About 21 years, right, Todd? Yeah, okay. So as far as time between uh, leaving the glory hole and reheating, you can usually count on a minute. Sometimes it will just depend on how much heat is in the glass. Uh, right now, uh, because of the thickness of the glass, he might actually get a little more working time than he would if this was a really thin vessel, which would cool off very quickly as the heat dissipates. So having the thicker glass is a little bit of an aid Yes, we do recycle waste. We're able to recycle and remelt all the clear glass that comes off. Now, anything that has color in it, we do not remelt in our furnace. So you'll see now that Todd has closed the end of the tube, basically making a closed cylinder, and this he'll be able to blow into in a few moments. Right now, he's still in the shaping and cooling process. Notice he angles the pipe. At different times, we'll uh, cool different portions of the glass on the metal table. We call that metal table a marver and by rolling the glass on it we selectively can cool portions. Notice he's cooling and shaping the back portion near the blowpipe and now he's changed his angle and he's pointing downward and cooling the front end if you will. Interestingly most glass pieces are made by forming the bottom half to two-thirds of the vessel first, then we transfer it to another pipe, and then we complete the top half or third, whatever's left to do. Right now he's just getting things all set up. The proportions are really important. If the vessel is too long, it's difficult to gather over. It's also difficult to control when you're blowing into it. If the glass vessel is too short, it's very easy to get too much air into it, make the bottom thin and crack out. So our ratio of diameter length is uh, really important and Todd's working on that. So I see we have even a few more viewers. You're watching Todd Hansen at the Art of Fire Glass Blowing Studio in Montgomery County, Maryland, just outside of Damascus. My name's Bruce Ferguson. I'll be doing the camera and narration. We also have here the owner of the studio, Foster Holcomb, and Josh Reese, who is also a full-time glass blower, uh, is assisting Todd with whatever needs doing. Todd's going to blow into the pipe, and you'll notice he had his finger over the mouthpiece. That traps compressed air in the pipe and allows it to inflate. When the glass is hot, it does not require a great deal from the spinning sidekick near it and the heat from the kinetic energy heats the glass. I'm sorry, I missed that uh, comment. We got Tita on the Winnebago back there. Okay. Yep, we'll, the we'll give the full introduction here in a moment. All right, so now Todd is putting the pipe over a little trough of water we have over here. It has a small pump, and you can see from the steam coming off, it's cooling the blow pipe. He's going to be reaching into our furnace, which holds about 400 pounds of molten glass at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And this big door over here is what he's going to be opening in a few moments and gathering. Now we can get a little bit better view of the Murini. As the glass cools, the colors become more evident. They no longer all have that bright orange glow. Todd's letting that cool right now so that when he goes in and gathers, the excessive heat does not penetrate those layers, causing them to collapse. So we have a little bit of downtime right here while we wait to gather for the next section. He'll be gathering clear glass. We only melt clear glass. That way we can manage to use multiple colors. Uh, some facilities have furnaces that are dedicated to single colors, but then you're kind of stuck having to have just whatever colors in there. All right, so there's a view inside the furnace. Todd's going to put the blowing iron in there with the glass. 
He points it down at an angle and he starts turning the pipe to collect clear glass over the Murini cylinder. He's holding it pointing downwards for some of the glass to strip off and now the glass is of such a fluid nature that he can actually let it drizzle off into the bucket. So we'll close this door here. Now he has what's called a block. It's a cherry wood cup. And it didn't quite fit the glass, so what he's using right now is even more interesting. It's folded newspaper that's been soaked in water. We use about seven sheets of newsprint and fold it up into a pad about eight by nine inches. We get it wet, but not sopping wet, and that combined, the thickness of the paper with the water, provides a perfect insulating surface. You can see the smoke rising from it and he'll stop before it burns the paper, and one of us will wet the paper in between his trips to the glory hole. He's hanging it down now, that will elongate it a little bit, and you'll notice he pushed some of the glass off past the Murini. We get a shot of that, you can see just a, an inch or so of the clear glass down beyond the Murini. He's kind of pinching it a little bit there with the newspaper, that's gonna help to cool it. Yes, the, oh, okay, Fita answered him. Yes, the furnace does run 24-7. All the other uh, gas-powered equipment is only on as needed when we're actually in use. Okay, he's getting a little bit of space on the marver here, and while we wait for the next step, Josh, would you mind opening up the glory hole there? Let's give folks a look at what a glory hole looks like on the inside. It really is just a bunch of ceramic rings. Uh, the blue you see on the bottom is glass that is broken and tripped off in there from uh, somebody using it. Sometimes having a piece explode from thermal shock, but for the most part, we don't have too much of that happen. So that's what our glory hole looks like. It's powered by propane and uh, there's a, a blower on the back What's he making? I'm sorry, I have to keep reminding myself to fill you all in. He's making what's called a Murini vase or cylinder. Murini are small squares of glass that have been fused together into a sheet and he's getting ready to gather again. And now you can see them through the clear glass. So we'll step back a little bit. Todd puts the iron, we call them irons or pipes interchangeably, gathers the glass up again and this time you'll strip off directly into the bucket. The viscosity of the glass is such that it just flows right off the end. By pointing it straight down, he allows the glass to distribute evenly around the gather. He'll make a trip over to this other marver, which is a little closer. Notice he's got the back end of the piece closest to the blowpipe rolling on there first and then he'll gradually change the angle a little bit as he wants to alter the shape and move things along. Hey, Foster. If you're just joining us, this is uh, Todd Hansen. We're at the Art of Fire glass blowing studio outside of Damascus, Maryland. Uh, basically a suburb of Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. Uh, we're about 30, 35 miles west of Baltimore and about the same distance north, northwest of Washington, D.C. By cooling the bottom there, he's now able to blow and the inflation will not be at the tip. You can kind of see a bright shadow around the base of the piece, the very bottom, and that's where he had cooled it, so it did not expand there. Now, nobody is going to want a cylindrical vase with a four and a half foot piece of steel attached to it. So in just a little bit, Todd will use a pair of metal blades we call jacks to cut a jack line or a neckline close to the blowpipe so that the piece can be separated. We have multiple doors on the glory holes so that we can adjust the opening uh, based on the size of the piece and we like to keep the doors closed as much as possible 
because all the heat escapes and we need the heat in the glory hole to keep the piece hot. So Todd opened that up just a little bit more so he could get the whole thing in there and get hot. At this stage of the game, he's heating the whole piece. He has a yoke in front of the glory hole, the pipe is balanced on, and he uses his foot to push that back and forth. The piece may not be excessively heavy, it's probably about six, maybe seven pounds at this point, but it really changes the feel of the weight when you extend that out four and a half feet away from your body. It makes it very difficult to hold and control. You don't need particularly good lungs for glass blowing. I've taught asthmatics to blow glass. As long as the glass is hot, it will inflate. Probably the most difficult skill to teach glass blowers is keeping the glass centered. So when you're doing your wood turning and you, um, you mount the piece of wood between the two plates and pinch it in there, you're establishing the center line. Our center line is constantly moving. Todd's inflating it, and you can see the inflation is toward the middle, not the tip and not at the top. Then when he gets ready, he'll take care of the jack line. So um, back to that question, no, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of lung power to play this, uh, or to, to blow this, because I was seguing, seguing <laughs> and it's not as difficult is playing the oboe or the trombone. I used to be a school music teacher. I speak from experience. Sometimes my tongue gets tied though and I say the word at the wrong time. <laughs> so anyway, Todd's now inflated the piece. He's uh, got the diameter increased, but you'll notice he didn't make it a tremendous amount longer yet. He's probably going to be doing his jack line pretty soon, which will be the point of separation from the pipe. The shape right now is uh, kind of a football shape if you're from the U.S. If you're from Europe, South America, the U.K., uh, it's a different type of football. All right, those jack blades now squeeze the glass, and Josh is using a wooden paddle to shield Todd's arm because there's a great deal of radiant heat coming off of that and it's really difficult to keep under control. And here's another part of the teamwork involved. Josh is gonna take a couple of reheats for Todd. That's quite a bit of weight out there, and uh, it's really helpful to have someone else to help take the load. So, uh, looks like we even got a few more people watching now. Welcome to the Art of Fire glass blowing studio outside Damascus, Maryland, a suburb of Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. Uh, we have a large facility here, and uh, you're watching Josh Reese right now uh, reheat the piece, and in just a moment, he's going to bring it back, present it to Todd Hansen, who is what we call the gaffer, or glass blower in charge of this piece right now, and you can see that it's elongating a little bit as they hang it down, and when Todd wants it brought up, Josh will bring it to level, and they'll keep it turning. Get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. Sometimes the weight gets a little excessive and also you'll notice we have quite a pivot point right there. We got a pivot point at the neckline. There was a great deal of heat in it, but by communicating with each other, they're perfectly able to keep things under control. So there we go. So Todd's blowing that out a little bit more. You can see the Murini separating, uh, spreading apart in the lower portion of the piece. This is pretty typical. As you blow, the pieces move further apart. I think it's just colors so intense up there, it just ran away. Yeah. Uh, we haven't had a real reduction in the use of red glass. Uh, yes, there is gold used in it but not to the point that it's made the cost prohibitive that we can't make pieces with red glass. We, we make a lot of stuff with red glass. <laughs> I found it too and the neck got tight. Yeah, I uh, don't worry, Marge. That wasn't nerve wracking. That was just something that happens in a regular day of glass blowing. You'll notice that that pivot point right now in the excess weight 
and he'll get it to hang straight. So by controlling the heat in the neckline and asking for Josh's capable assistance between the two of them, they'll keep this thing on point. The main thing to concentrate on right now is the lower half of the vessel because once it's transferred to another pipe, they'll be able to do whatever they want to the top half. Could you grab a paddle and flatten the bottom? Okay, so Todd's asking Josh to uh, get a paddle. They're going to flatten the bottom. Of course, nobody would want their cylindrical vase rolling off the table. So we flatten the bottom before we attach it to the putty. And in order to do this, he brings the piece back out of the glory hole some to heat just the bottom. Foster's behind me. We're going to be lighting up that real loud torch in a moment. And what we'll do with that torch is heat the rest of the piece as they get ready to attach the punty. Okay, now we're on with the torch. Here comes the big loud noise. Uh, just put up a full size. Okay, so we got a little bit of communication going on right there. Todd is asking Josh to put up a different size pipe. They're going to get that going. Todd's going to bring the piece back. And Josh comes over with the paddle. And you'll see Todd turning the pipe, holding the piece in place with the newspaper. And Josh, at the same time, presses on the bottom to flatten it. If they should not have enough heat to do all the flattening they want, they'll simply go back and do it again. Once Todd is happy with what he's got there, then they'll work on what's called the transfer. We're going to deliberately break the piece off of this pipe. Todd's going to, I think he's ready. Okay, so Todd is heating the area near the neck. We don't want that to get cold or it will fracture. In a moment, he'll take what's called a flash heat or, or quick heat in the glory hole. Josh is over here right in front of us, forming up the glass on a fairly substantial iron, a full inch in diameter. And you'll notice there's only a little bit of glass off the end of the pipe. We don't want a long finger of glass sticking off the end. The piece would wobble all over the place. So what we're going to do is attach that punty to the bottom of the piece and then break it free from the vessel. Now I have to get over here and kind of stay out of the way, but we'll give you a view of what's going on. There's the flattened bottom of the vessel. Josh brings it over and Todd places it. And now he'll turn both pipes. Josh is just supporting now. He's basically turning both of those irons and this tool called a sofietta or puffer cools that juncture, okay? We don't want that really, really hot or the piece will wobble. Here comes the noisy torch, but I'm loud. So as he heats that and makes sure it's still just a little bit soft, in just a moment, he'll put some water onto the neckline, that joint he created. He'll bring it up toward the rail of the bench, tap the pipe, the vibration breaks it free, and Josh has the piece on the new pipe and over to the glory hole. All right, there we go. So now, as I said earlier, we create the bottom half to two-thirds of a vessel first, then we work on the top. You can see that Josh has the piece only partway in, and uh, that's because we don't want the bottom to get too hot. That piece was cold enough to fracture. That means that it is going to take a little while to reheat until it's malleable again. I just saw somebody made a comment about Tuesday. Uh, if you guys would like to see more of this and learn more about different uh, techniques of glass blowing, please join us on Tuesday mornings. If you've only got a short amount of time, we do a half hour on YouTube Live at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time U.S. But we do a full two-hour presentation where we do multiple pieces on Tuesdays on Facebook Live 
at 11 a.m. from 11 a.m. to uh, 1 p.m. local time. So that's what we've got going as far as demonstrations. Uh, please like, share. I'm, I'm really happy to see the comments. Uh, it flies across the screen pretty quick, but between Theta answering some of the questions and me answering some of the questions, we're glad to provide you with information. And we've been sitting here staring at Todd do all the work, and that's exactly what I was talking about, how long that uh, tip of the piece takes to reheat before it can be worked again. So, it's going to a case. Okay, so now you can see the orange glow at the end of the piece. That's where the bulk of the heat is. For the next four to five inches past that, it's kind of a glowing orange. Beyond that, toward the base of the piece, it's almost dark enough that you can see the Murini. What time is that UK? Uh, UK is plus five, five hours, hours, okay? Five, so you're yeah. five hours ahead of us on your coordinated universal time. Right now, Todd is using the torch to heat the punty area. We've got to keep the entire piece of glass well over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit or else it will start cracking and then come apart. So, so Todd is asking for a, a But somebody will call. Somebody will call you back. We're using Foster's cell phone to do this uh, uh, filming and presentation. I'm going to walk around over here so that you can get a view of what the three of them are doing. Foster is going to paddle the lip to keep it flat in relation to the body of the piece. Josh is going to use a pair of jack blades to keep the mouth rounded out. Foster will also use a paddle to shield Todd's arm. Okay, so Todd's using the newspaper to hold it in place. Foster is paddling the lip to make it flat. And Josh is using the jack blades to open gently and keep it round. Okay. Ah, somebody going to be watching from Bonnie, Scotland. Wonderful. Uh, that's great, glad to hear it. What part of Scotland? I spent about six weeks in Edinburgh during the Fringe Festival one year and got to tour a great deal of the country. It's uh, really beautiful. And we've got several folks that visit our FaceTime, uh, uh, Facebook Live presentations uh, from London, from uh, the Netherlands, uh, Germany, quite a few places. So welcome and join us. So right now, Todd's got the full piece into the glory hole, and then he pulls back just to heat the top. Northern Ireland. Okay, very good. Okay, so somebody from Guam. Wonderful. Dunfermline flight. Yes, yeah, just across the bridge from Edinburgh. Yep. I really enjoyed going out to, uh, to the island uh, out there, just outside of Edinburgh, in the middle of the river. The... Okay, from Rebel Country in Ireland. Okay, so when Todd says everybody off, that's because he wants them to take the tools away. He's looking at his piece, okay? So, we're done. So it wasn't quite the cylinder all the way from Orlando, Florida. Well, that's good too. So now what they're going to do is heat the piece a little bit. He's trying to drive heat into the bottom of that so that it's not cold enough to crack. He wants a a nice separation when he takes the piece off of the blowpipe. So sometimes if the piece has a mind of its own a little bit, 
we wind up uh, uh, changing the shape a little bit, but this is still a, a beautiful vase Todd has created here. We'll go around and watch the uh, knockoff here in just a moment. Josh has on a pair of insulated gloves. This piece is still going to be close to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. Plenty hot enough to burn anything we've got. So Josh has these Kevlar mitts on and they will protect his hand and arms as he catches the piece. Todd will lay the piece on the bench rail. He'll use a drop of water onto the juncture between the punty and the piece. And then when he puts the water in that joint, he'll break it off. So right now, more heat. Okay. You all right? Yeah. Catch the plates. Yeah. Don't fall into the flame. All right. Step yeah. away from the flame. Okay. So the reason for heating that punny is it's not getting as hot as the rest of it. We can see that him heating the piece in there, the punny's not as, uh, as deep. Okay. That's what the area is creating hot. So. I can't go 20 more minutes. I'm done. We'll show the folks around and give you a little tour and a little explanation. There's not much point in working this piece when it's done. Okay, I know we were allocated an hour. And uh, no, this one is not one that someone could do by themselves. He would definitely, we would definitely have to have help with this as he did. So, where are you going with it, Josh? Back here? So we want to let Josh get in the corner and then open the door, Foster. Okay. So here Todd comes with the tweezers, a drip of water, a tap on the pipe. It comes free. Josh carries it on over, right past us, and back here to an annealer. We'll explain annealing and all that stuff in a minute. They've got to hold the door back so it doesn't hit Josh. He's putting that in there. You can see that it's so hot the gloves are smoking. So there we go. Thank you, guys. Well, come on. Let's hear some comments and some cheers and whatnot for Todd. Great job there, Todd. That was Todd Hansen making a mosaic vase, a Murini vase. And uh, so anyway, that's what we've got there. We've got a few more minutes in this. And since it's my understanding that we've got mostly woodworkers watching, I would like to explain something about what we call the annealing process. We're clear there, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. So this box of bricks is called an annealer. And its sole function is to allow the temperature of the glass to come down slowly. So if you're familiar with, say, a brick patio or driveway, it gets very hot during the summertime, but releases heat late into the evening. This is powered by propane and air. We run it at about 900 degrees. All day long, we put our pieces in there. With this particular glass that we're working with, the critical range is between about 900 degrees and 700 degrees. If the glass goes through that temperature range too quickly, it shatters, and it does happen. So with this particular box of bricks, we're able to calibrate how quickly it releases and it takes about eight to nine hours to go from 900 degrees down to room temperature. The piece that we just put away was approximately 1300 degrees. It's okay to go from 13 to nine. It's just that we don't want to be going below nine very much. And what we have for that one over here is an electronic control. Now the sun's coming in the window and so I'm going to see if I can get this screen shown up here. And this is our control panel for the electric annealer that they put the piece in. The beauty of the electric annealer is we can uh, program it for different times. What up? Go make another piece. Okay, Todd's going to make us another piece. Okay. So uh, while he's warming things up, the pipes have to be pre-warmed in order to pick up glass. The electric annealers we can program for as long as we want. So with a thick piece of glass, we might want to program it for 16, 18 hours, something like that, 
with a very gradual temperature reduction. So that's the beauty of the electric. However, it is drawing electricity that entire time. With the uh, propane-fired brick annealer, once we shut it off, there's no more power consumption. So Todd has gathered two gathers of glass on the end of a blowpipe, and he's got what's called frit here. This is granular glass. We get it from the manufacturers, and we can get it in a variety of grains. Uh, some very thick, some very, well, as fine as a grain of salt or sand. All right, so now he's uh, working on warming that up and melting the frit in. What will you be making, Todd? We're going to do a little uh, heart since we're coming close to Valentine's Day. Ah, oh, marvelous. And that's a, uh, the frit that I picked up is a little pink and a little bit of, uh, actually two shades of pink. But it makes a really pretty uh, rose color. And we're going to use something, this is a, sort of an old school style, we're going to use a wooden mold to get our heart shape. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll still turn this around and finish it using the hand tools. So we'll get to see a little bit of everything. Okay. So what Todd's referring to in the mold is this wooden construction here. And it looks like an upside down heart, and that's intentional. The lobes of the heart expand in the lower portions of the mold, and there's a hole in the top of it through which the glass extends and it'll still be on the blowpipe. By shaping the gather of glass just right, kind of bulbous, He'll be able to put it down in there, and then when he blows, it will expand evenly throughout that mold. So Foster will be closing that up for him. We keep them in water. We don't want them burning up, and we don't want them cracking. So it is uh, a wooden mold. There are a variety of materials we can use for molds, but this one happens to be wood. And what we'll do is, after letting the water penetrate the sides, It'll be placed on the floor and Todd will use it to shape the heart. But before he does that, he'll be blowing some air into the piece and he'll also be using a jack line to create separation from the blowpipe. At first he'll just extend it, it won't actually come off the pipe, but he'll have a uh, sort of a tubular portion at the top. The back of the jack serves to cool the bottom, just like the metal table did, and there he's cutting the line. By leaning out, you can see that he's stretching that line into kind of an hourglass shape. And that's the area that will fit exactly into the hole at the top of the mold by bringing it out away some. Now he's flattening it because the heart has basically a flattened shape. So I'll get out of his way and he'll be heating it up here in a moment and we'll get the mold on the floor here we go. okay so now you see he's got the basic shape to go down in there you can see that when the mold is closed there'll be a hole an opening at the top that thin tube that he made is going to sit right in there he will not be turning the iron as he blows because it needs to expand evenly into that mold. So when he brings it out, it'll be super hot. He'll put it down in there. He'll blow very, very hard, and he'll have it closed with his legs. He gets it in place, benches it together at the ankles, and in a moment, we'll see steam coming out. There it is. When he gets enough, there we go. There's the heart shape. And the camera didn't quite keep up, but that's all right. We'll step on over here. He'll be coming back to the bench in just a moment. And there's your heart shape with the large lobes. The use of the tweezers increases the depth of that area between the lobes. Josh is ready with a punty. The punty attaches to the piece. Now Todd breaks it free at the bottom. And that's really about all the finished work that's really gonna need to be done. He's gonna let that get wet and then he's gonna tap the feet right and it comes free. So now the piece is on the punty iron and there's a little hole in the end of it. We have to leave these open at some point because if we completely seal it, the heat will cause the air inside to expand. And if we do that, we've got a mess on our hands. So now what Todd is going to do 
is when he comes back, he's going to gently pinch and shape that area toward the bottom of the heart. And I'll show you a little bit of that as he starts it, and then we'll go over to a display we have and show you the finished product. Again, that glass was cold enough to fracture. It takes a little while to reheat so that it can be melted and worked. You can see that the end of the heart is bright orange by picking up his tweezers and pulling it out some. He'll gradually reshape it. He'll pull it out some, put a curve to it. And we're going to show you what that finished product's going to look like right now. There are some in our catalog. You can look at artoffire.com and see the pieces we make. But here's a few that we have on display right now. So you can see how the lower portion is curved. And then here's another one with an opaque stripe pattern. We have others here. Here are pieces made with Murini. These are some vases that Todd has made in the past. So here's one with a uh, Murini pattern where they go opposite one another. We've got one here with just pink squares. And now he's ready to pull that, knock that little tip off the end by tapping it with the tweezers. Now he's got that little bitty tiny hole on the bottom. He'll be able to grip that and curve the piece. So in just a few moments, uh, we'll come around here. You can see that mainly most of the piece is outside of the heat. We don't want that to get misshapen. It just needs to be warm enough not to fracture. So what he'll do here in a moment is return to the bench using his tweezers, reach into that slight uh, opening and give it a really gentle curve. You can see the heat is at the bottom of the heart by just grabbing it with the tweezers. He's able to, able to pull it to the side. And there we go. Beautiful. So this is uh, a heart that will hang either from a window or some other place you'd like some ornamentation. He's going to put a hook on it now. What he'll do is knock it off into this little cradle. After he taps it off into the cradle, he'll go get a small amount of clear glass on his iron and then put a hook on it. There it comes off the putty iron. And now he'll bring that back. By drawing up on the iron gently, he thins the glass out, he raises it, cuts right through it with the shears. The hot glass is very easy to cut through, and then he'll put a curve to it, hook it over. And then when he gets done with that, it'll go into the annealer. Our typical process is to put our pieces in the annealer, and then at the end of the working day, we turn the annealer off, and there we go. Beautiful. Come on, folks, let's hear it for Todd. Beautiful job, beautiful, all righty. Okay, so, let's, uh, we got a couple more minutes on here and I know that someone else will be filling in in the next hour, but let's uh, come back here so I get a chance to show you these. Uh, if you would like to check for descriptions of other uh, demos, you can check online. We've done uh, been doing this for six months now, every Tuesday, so we've got a lot of pieces to show. But I would really like to show you how some of the Murini pieces turn out. Here's one that is just squares with a, a pink outside on each square. Kind of gives it a window effect. We can do it with uh, the same colors in uh, crisscross pattern. Here's a very attractive bowl with a lot of different Murini in it. So there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, we also uh, make a lot of other glass. We've got a full display of ornaments here. We just finished a uh, presentation last week uh, tied into Valentine's Day. We've got some beautiful vases, champagne flutes, etc. So uh, we've got a, a whole lot to show you. Go to artoffire.com and uh, we'll take a quick trip through the gallery and that will also allow us to introduce you to the brains behind the outfit, Theta Hansen. Hello, Theta. Hello, guys. 
there. And her beautiful friends. This is Sparta. Okay, Sparta, okay. So, uh, just a quick tour of the gallery to give you an idea. We make all of the blown glass in here. We do have a few other artists that uh, have uh, brought over pieces of ceramic or small flame work pieces. Here's a selection. We're basically organized by colors. So we have some beautiful bowls and vases throughout here. Uh, if you check in us uh, this coming Tuesday, we're going to be doing something like this, which is called Encalmo, which is basically joining two cups or more of various colors. We do a lot of cane work. We have pieces where we rake the cane. Here's another piece where the colors were applied, twisted up, and raked. Uh, we've got a lot of green pieces over here. Green piece, that sounds like that's ready for a pun, but I will resist. We have more pieces back here. We've got uh, reticello, which has all the tiny bubbles in between the pieces. Here's more murini right here. Quite a wide variety and a lot of tableware. A lot of tableware, we have uh, champagne flutes, we have wine glasses, stemless wines, water glasses. Most anything you'd want for tableware here. And we're just taking a quick look around to show you some of the more interesting things. Here's a beautiful one, a flattened pitcher, okay, with a gold leaf uh, on top of it. Another piece over here. This is a really pretty uh, pattern here with the frit creating tiny bubbles through, or forcing the color through. So uh, that's, and here's our gold display. Let's take a quick look down here. This is one of my personal favorites. I, I kind of like doing these kind of things. This is called a wigwag design. And those all started out with straight canes and then they were twisted back and forth. And that's how we get a pattern like that or like this, the same type of thing. So that's pretty much the extent of our gallery. Thank you for joining us. Let's see uh, if we got any final words from Foster or anything like that. So we've got uh, four working stations here, uh, four benches and four glory holes. You'd be afraid to walk around in a glass shop. Ah, well, the, all the cats in here seem that glass seems to survive. So all glass work, workers work from a bench and back to a glory hole. This is the bench where Foster works. His glory hole is the first one over here along the wall. And then Todd, you saw working at the next one, and then the rest of us work throughout the studio. And we've got a bank of annealers along the back wall. And since we still have another minute and a half or so, we take a look at our wall of color. So uh, while Josh is following me around, I'll ask him to pick out a couple of tubs of frit just so he can show you different sizes. And this entire wall here has our solid bar stock, okay? So here are a couple of frits. This purple is a very uh, bigger frit, okay? So that's opaque. Opaque, and we've got transparent. Yes. And this copper blue over here is really pretty fine, so that's it. And there's a whole set of tall uh, stemmed glasses that Foster made. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Todd, for the great work. Thank you. And uh, our pleasure. We'll see you later. Right. Join us on Tuesday, YouTube at 1030, Facebook at 11. Bye-bye. Say goodnight, Dick. <laughs> Say goodnight, Dick. <laughs>